Please be seated. All right, so thankful you folks made it here tonight. Get your Bibles ready. Let's go to Psalm chapter number 10. As we continue our study in the book of Psalms, we're in chapter number 10. Just a couple of reminders. One of the big reminders is this Sunday, we do have our church administration meeting. So that's going to be taking place this Sunday. We are also going to have um, a potluck. It's Southern Potluck, so come dressed up Southern, bring Southern food, and uh, that should be a lot of fun, a good Southern Potluck. And then that is also Vision Day. It's a day that I get things set up for uh, the church and just kind of give you an idea of where the Lord has laid on my heart of uh, some things we would like to try and emphasize and goals we would like to shoot for for this up and coming year. So hopefully you could make it out to that and be there because it sets the tone for the church for the rest of the year, and if you miss it, it's never that fun. All right, so let's go ahead and get to uh, Proverbs, cha or, I'm sorry, uh, Psalms chapter number 10, and this is one of those really hard Psalms. Um, it's a very personal Psalm. Remember, it's a continuation from Psalm chapter number 9, and we think that this was Psalm 9 and 10 were probably put together, but David starts off with the most baffling question that's going to plague every single Christian. The most baffling question basically is this, when you look out at our world, why does God appear to be silent, right? Uh, when evil seems to be prospering, uh, why is God not actively, visibly judging the wicked? Or why is he allowing all this mess we see in our world to continue? I mean, God has promised to take care of his own, correct? He's promised to take care of the widows and the fatherless and the orphans. Why does he appear to be so silent or unconcerned in a number of areas? You look all over the world or perhaps something happened in your life and you sit back and say, where was God in all of this, right? And sometimes you can kind of think it out in your mind and say, well, I can see this or that. But other times you may just sit there dumbfounded and say, I don't know. I just have to trust the Lord that he knows what's going on. He knows the beginning from the end and I need to trust in him above all else. So that's... That's the basic answer that I can give you right now. I mean, there's, there's things I can say about, well, you know, this happens and that happens or God allows this or God allows that, but that more than likely is not going to satisfy anyone's curiosity. It is a question that has constantly been asked by every Christian when you see this evil in the world. I mean, take, for instance, the United States. Why is it getting more and more and more wicked? Why has not God jumped in already and straightened some of these people out? You know, why hasn't that happened yet? Of course, we know God is long-suffering, and he doesn't want any to perish. Sometimes it goes along the lines of, of God allowing the nation to reap what they've sown. Uh, sometimes there's, there's all kinds, like I said, there's all kinds of different reasons. But ultimately, all those answers come up to God. So basically what David does in this psalm, he's plagued by that question. Whatever situation is in, he appears that the enemies are winning and that God is silent. He looks at the world and he sees what's going on. And after he asks the question in verse number one, he says, why standest thou afar off, O Lord? You know, why, why are you disinterested? Why are you not getting involved? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? And after he asks that question, then he starts delineating what wicked people are like. And last Last week, we saw the number one attribute of all wicked people is that they are very prideful. Pride is the number one sin of all wicked people, and that leads to a host of all other sins. Now, through their pride, they've come up in verse number four to say this. They say the wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. And we needed to stop there to remind ourselves when it says that God is not in all his thoughts, that is basically saying is they don't think on God at all. Matter of fact, that's another way of saying that they don't believe God exists. That's why they do what they do. They do not believe God exists. God does not enter into their thoughts. They don't give him a second uh, thought when they do something wrong. So that allows wicked people to do some pretty vile things. If they don't think that there is a God, then they're not going to be held accountable to anybody, right? So why don't I just do the survival of the fittest? Why don't I lie, cheat, and steal? Why don't I pick on people if I'm not going to be held accountable for it? As long as I stay away from uh, you know, the law and things like that, or maybe I make enough money that I could pay off the law, I could do whatever I want because there is no God. God does not entertain their thoughts. That's how prideful they are. They think they themselves are God let alone the God of the heavens. And so David starts off with that, reminding us that the wicked are very prideful. Well, let's move on to the next section. And we're going to see that not only are the wicked prideful, but the wicked certainly are not ashamed. 
They are not ashamed for doing that which is wrong. We're going to look at verses 6 through 8, and maybe a little bit more tonight. Depends how much our time goes. It says this in verse 6. He has said in his heart, speaking of the wicked one, He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. He sitteth, the wicked one, sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set against the poor. He lieth in the wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He croucheth and humbleth himself, and the poor may fall by his strong ones. He hath said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. That's where I'm going to try and get to tonight. I know I said verse 8, but I want to get to verse number 11. So let's jump on into this. First, we see they're not ashamed. It's actually verses 6 and 7 here. In verse number 6, it says, He hath said in his heart, a heart, of course, there means the inner man. What is this innermost thoughts? Now, we cannot tell someone's motives, and I can't tell what you are thinking, but God can. And that's what Scripture says. The evil people, this is what is going on in their heart, in their thoughts. Because they do not believe that there is a God, and their pride is so strong, he says this in his heart, in his innermost thoughts, he says, I shall not be moved. That word moved there means shaken or flinching. It means to be wavering or toddling. The wicked in his heart says, I'm taking a position and I'm not changing it. I don't care what you say. I don't care what the consequences are. I don't care what happened. I will not be shaken, he says. The reason why they're able to say that is there's no fear of God before their eyes, right? They don't think they're held accountable to God. So they can take an ungodly position. They can ruin someone's life and go away smiling about it and say, I don't care. I'm not going to be moved. You know, and that's why it's so hard when you allow some of these bullies and wicked people to, to get you down or do something offensive to you. And then you go on and say, well, I'm never going to forgive them. They got to come back to me. You know, if it's a wicked person that's not saved, chances are they don't care. They don't care. They don't care that you're upset. They don't care that you think about them. They don't care what they did to you. They're not going to be moved. You're nothing to them, right? So don't waste your time with them. Forgive them in your heart and move on. Because the wicked say in their heart, I'm not going to be shaken. I'm not going to flinch. I don't care what's going on. He saith in his heart, I shall not be moved. Why? For I shall never be in adversity. In his thought life, he says this, the word for there means it's a causal sentence. So the idea is showing the reason or the cause of this in his heart. He says, I will not be moved because, he says, I will not suffer, basically. I shall never be in adversity. Adversity means evil, harm, or in an undesirable position. So what he's basically saying here is he doesn't care how wicked he is. He can escape any consequence of his sin. Nothing bad is going to happen to him for what he just did. Right. Nothing's bad for his pride because he's overcome. He's, he's, he's done what he wanted to do and no one can touch him, right? Mm -hmm. So in his heart, he says, I'm not going to change my positions. I'm not going to come down to you. I'm not going to say sorry. I'm not, I'm not, this is who I am. This is what happened. Because nothing evil is ever going to happen to me. Right. Nothing bad is going to happen to me. God's not going to judge me because there is no God. He believes he's the highest authority. He will continue on his pathway and he will never change his position. He is the master of his own destiny in his own mind. He is accountable only to himself and no one else. That is the heart of the wicked. And because of that, because what's going on in the inside of the heart, like the word of God says, out of the treasures of the heart is what comes out of our mouths, right? So sometimes we do something, or I know there's this very famous, I hear this a lot between husbands and wives or parents with children, when a child does something or a spouse does something and the person yells and they say, you shouldn't talk to me like that. Well, you made me do it. If you would have done that, then I wouldn't have done that. Yeah. That's wrong. Because what has come out of you was already in your heart. That's what Jesus Christ said. He said, what proceeds out of a man, out of his heart, the issues of his heart comes out. So when we look at this wicked person who doesn't believe that there is a God, 
who says, I'm never going to be moved. I'm only accountable unto myself. Nothing bad's going to happen to me. I'll be able to get out of it or whatever. Look what he does with his mouth. Look how he communicates. Look what comes out of him. Verse 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. The idea of his mouth being full, the word full there means completely filled up. There's no room for anything else. There's no room for niceties. There's no room for truth. There's no room for anything. He's like a chameleon. He can say whatever he wants. It's just filled his mouth. If he opens up his mouth, it'd be filled with all this stuff that he talks about here. The first things he mentions is cursing. Now, cursing is interesting because it's not your normal word for cursing. Normally, the word for cursing in the Bible doesn't mean like using a dirty word, right? A lot of people, we tell that to our kids, stop cursing when they use a bad word. That's not what cursing is in the Bible. Cursing in the Bible is taking a pledge uh, in the sense of, I'm going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and then lie about it. That's the idea of cursing because you said you were going to tell the truth and you told a lie. All right. So that's not being accurate is usually the idea for cursing someone. Well, this word actually comes from the idea of taking an oath. It's taking an oath that has bad consequences to it. So in other words, what this individual does is it could be one of two ways to understand what this word cursing means. So in the Bible, you'll see this word cursing when, when the Lord says, I've made an oath. You could say a curse, but he said, I make an oath between you and me. You follow this, good things are going to happen. You don't follow this, bad things are going to happen. Then the people say, we will take that oath, right? So the idea is, we know that there's something going on. It's like a contract deal. It's like a covenant deal. I'm taking an oath. I am going to do this, but if I don't keep my side of it, then something evil will happen to me. Hence the idea of curse that I'm going to tell you to do this. And if you don't respond in good faith, then a curse is going to come upon you. The bad things are going to come upon you. That's this idea of cursing here. Now it says his mouth is filled with it. So what does that mean? That his mouth is filled with oaths, which have bad consequences. Well, it means before two things. One, it could mean before man. The idea means this. He's making others take an oath with severe consequences. So if I'm cursing my wife, let's say, I'll say, okay, honey, you have to cook me dinner tomorrow or else you owe me $1,000 or pay me $1,000 and I won't destroy your store. Along those type of lines, you know what I'm talking about? That's the idea, putting out something. So before men, if those types of cursings, he's good at intimidating people. He's good at making them, getting in a contract with himself that he himself has no business wanting to keep, but he wants to enforce on others. Or it could be that he's doing this cursing before the law. And that's the idea that I just kind of intimated there. That he's going to say, yeah, I'll keep my end of the bargain. I'll, I'll sign this contract. But have absolutely no intention mm -hmm. of completing what he signed. Right. That's the two way this word cursing could mean. All right, I, didn't determine, I couldn't determine in my mind which one fit the best. But the idea is his mouth is filled with these cursings. Whether he's taking someone and basically saying, I'm going to strike a deal with you like a loan shark. Or he's saying, I'll strike a deal with you, wink, 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 or crossing my fingers, hand between my eyes, pinky promise, or whatever you do with those things nowadays. And I'm not going to, I actually have no idea. I actually have no intent of keeping it. Did you ever do that when you're a kid? You cross, oh, my legs crossed, didn't count. Well, my fingers crossed behind my back, I didn't really mean it. Right? They have all this kind of, so they got all that kind of stuff going on. That's the idea of what cursing could be. So put that in your mind. It's not that he is out there using all kinds of rotten words, which fit them, of course, but that's not the, the, the text of what it's saying here. It says here that his mouth is full of cursing, and the next thing is full of is deceit. The word deceit is actually what it means. It means to say one thing, but actually mean another. It is taken from the commerce stage. The idea of commerce <coughs> is that you're buying five pounds of apples. So I put them in a bag, I place them on there on my scale, and the scale shows that it's five pounds. So you pay me for the five pounds of apples. You go home to your house, and you find out when you put it on your scale, it was only four and a half pounds. Mm -hmm. Wait, what happened? Well, I had a faulty scale. I deceived you. 
Or like the, before when you used to buy food from a butcher, they'd say, uh, hey, make sure you get your thumb off that scale, right? Because the butcher <laughs> would act like he's holding it on, putting his thumb a little bit more pressure so that you pay a little bit more for that meat, even though not, I'm not indicting butchers. <laughs> it's just, I've seen that in a story, all right? I, I know butchers are honest, hardworking men and ladies. I'm not saying that. It's just an illustration that you've probably seen or heard about where they put the food on top of there and they're holding it down. You'll have the Old, older lady or whatever. Hey, hey, Marty, you, you got your finger on that scale? You know, get your fingers off that scale. Oh, I, no, it's not. I got, right? That's to be deceitful. So that's what these people do. They're deceitful. They're saying one thing out of their mouth, but they completely mean something else. That's what goes on in the wicked's mouth. The other thing that they deal with here, not only is their mouth full of cursings, their mouth is full of deceits, and their mouth is full of fraud. The word fraud literally means to be an extortioner, exchanging money or goods because of threats or force. You do this or I'm going to sue you. You do this or I'm going to do that. You do this or you got this fine. Right there. They're going to do whatever they can. You do this like the previous illustration. You do this or I'm going to, you know, you pay me to, to, uh, uh, to protect you from that other gang over there. You pay me. Otherwise, they're going to get you and I'll unleash them on you. You know, you don't want their wrath. That's what, they're, that's what they're all about. They're all about fraud. They're all about intimidation. They're all about deceit. They're all about manipulating people. That's what their mouth is full of when you see these wicked people. Hence, the number of our politicians. Right? Yeah. Listen to what they say. Do they ever say what they mean? Look into our media. Do they ever say what you... And then if you don't agree with them, what do they do? You're part of the cancel culture now. And they're going to do whatever they can. And if you don't get in line, you're not going to get a movie. You're going to get taken off your pro thing. You're going to get your church closed down. You're going to lose your job. We're going to sue you. We're going to take you to the ACLU. And it goes on and on and on. Yeah. You just got to look at our world. It is so filled with these people. And you sit there and you scratch your head saying, what is wrong with them? Well, this is what's wrong with them. They don't believe that there's a God, genuine God of the Bible. They think that they're never going to be moved, that they're always right. They have no one accountable. And so their mouth is able to lie when it suits them the best. They can use fraud and extortion and cursings to get what they want. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. The word mischief means nothing but disaster, evils, distresses, and trouble. The word vanity means harm, injustices, deceits, and falsehoods. So what does this mean? What does it mean that it's under his tongue? Well, the idea simply is this, is that that individual on the front can speak eloquently. He can sound nice. He can say what you want him to say. But then if you look underneath his tongue, what he really intends to say, it's nothing but mischief. It's nothing but trouble. It's nothing but evil. So these people are very good at speaking. But again, it's not what they intended to say. If you would look under what their actual intention was, under their tongue, you look under the tongue, not the front when they're talking, but look under their tongue, what the real intent is, you would see that they are filled with nothing but vileness. You cannot believe a word they say, no matter how eloquent, no matter how gruff, their true intention is never revealed. It has to be found out. Again, look at our world today. Can you believe anything you see? Anything you read? You used to be able to say, well, if I see it, I'll believe it. Do you see how much they can manipulate videos nowadays? Yeah. Did you see the new thing where they can actually have the, the computer artificial intelligence? You could speak two sentences and they could copy your voice and accent and make it play back like it was you speaking. Yes. Imagine what that's going to do for voice recognition and different things. It's incredible what they're doing yeah. with, the, with the AI and all that kind of stuff. And you, you can't believe it they're saying you don't know what they're talking about you have to dig and dig and dig and dig to find the truth because he feels he's not accountable to anyone why does he have to be truthful just as long as he gets his way they are known as the chameleons they can change their shade they can change their color they can change your tone depending on the situation and it doesn't bother them one way or another that's what a wicked heart is like the next thing we learn about the wicked is from uh, verses eight on down is that they're very secretive in what they do Funny, if you would draw, under, I'm not telling you to do it right now, but if you wanted to, 
look under these next three verses, uh, four verses, 8, 9, and 10, 11, and look how many times the word secret or privily or hidden is used, right? It is very apparent that these three or four verses are dealing with how the wicked are very secretive. And it gives us a picture of what they're truly like. In verse number 8, it says, He sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. Well, sitteth means to dwell, right? That's where he likes to find himself. What is a lurking place? Well, literally, the lurking place means an ambush site. Mm -hmm. Do you know what an ambush site is? An ambush site means that it looks like it's a nice, common area where you be perceived that it'd be safe. But in actuality, you have two armies or someone set up on the side. They're just waiting to come through right through this because they've channeled you. And they're going to ambush you. You have no idea that they're coming. You, have, you, didn't, you didn't expect it. You didn't suspect it. You were just doing about your business. But these people, what they do in the cities and in the villages, they're all lurking back. These wicked criminals, these wicked people, they're looking back. And they're just, they know the spots where those cameras are not. They know how to get those cameras shut off. They know where that's going to be and where that's going to be and who's going to talk and who's not going to talk. And they know, they know the spots exactly. You watch the kids that bully kids inside high schools. They know where the cameras are not at. They know where to go to pick on people. And then you find out later on what happened out, what's going out there. That's what wicked people do. They love to do it secretly. They love to go to the lurking places, the places of ambush. And when they get to these places of ambush, it says... He sitteth in the lurking places of the village. In the secret places doth he murder the innocent. The secret places means places that are easily hidden. You know, if you're going to go kill someone, you usually don't do it right in broad daylight. You do it somewhere where you can easily hide the evidence, easily hide what you have done. A way to cover up your tracks. You don't do it in broad daylight. And what these evil, wicked people do, these criminals will go around and as they sit and they lie in ambush for people, they wait into the secret place. They know where it can be easily hidden to kill or murder innocent people. Innocent people are those people that are free from guilt or any charge. They're just people going about their daily lives. They're just people that are trying to work hard and take care of their families and, and go to work and come home and, and provide and just be a good community citizen is what they're trying to be. They're not doing anything to anyone. They're not part of some mafia group. They're not trying to topple over some government. They're just nice people just trying to, trying to make ends meet. And you got a bunch of creeps out there trying to take advantage of them, setting up ambushes for them, murdering them, killing them. And we're supposed to give them time to change according to our government, which doesn't happen. It goes on. What he ends up doing here is he does it. His eyes are privily set against the poor. His eyes is interesting. That's the word that literally means his pupils. It means he's got a laser focus on something. He knows how he can scan a crowd and he can find the person who is poor. The word poor there is someone that's unfortunate, someone that can't defend themselves, someone that can't protect themselves, and his eyes privily set. The idea of privily set means literally he's hiding it. So as he's scamming the crowd, his eyes are laser focused on who the weak ones are, who the ones he thinks he can take advantage of. But when you're watching him, you're not going to tell. He's going to be able to hide that. His eyes are going to be hiding, but in his mind and in his thoughts, he's scanning, finding who he can scam, who he can get, who he can murder, who he can get, who is the one that can't defend themselves. It's a pretty sick description of what's going on in the wicked's life. And, and then it gives us a, a description to help us understand it a little bit better. It draws from nature. It says here, his eyes are privily set against the poor. These unfortunate ones that can't defend themselves. He lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lieth in wait to catch the poor. He doth catch the poor when he draweth him into his net. He lieth in wait secretly again as a lion in his den. That word den literally means a thicket. Now the picture is, if you've ever seen a lion attack, matter of fact, uh, my son came in while I was studying some more today. He's like, Dad, what in the world are you watching? I was watching, how do lions attack? How do lions do things? I, I want to get a good picture. I want to be able to explain to the people what it is. If David knew how this worked. You know, he, he was a, a shepherd and he knew how they would attack the sheep. The lions would come and attack the sheep or how they would get them all scarce, whatever. How does that work? What does it do? Well, I found out something really interesting. 
I didn't notice, but lions are very famous for ambushing people. They're very famous. That's how they get their food. Yep. They ambush, and if you watch them, what they'll do, they'll have the male lion hide in a thicket, right? So a lot of grass or something, and he walks just like, you know, you see the cool cats walk, mm -hmm. and they're walking all slow and barely moving, and he creeps up till he finds a spot, and he gets down on his haunches. Very patient. Guess who's over there where all the people are, where, where all the animals are? It's the mama lion. It's the lioness. And what the lioness does, the lioness will sit there. She's stuck there. She snuck in there. She'll sit there, and she'll just make her presence known. She'll stand up. She'll make a noise. She'll do something to get that group of animals, wildebeest or whatever it is, sheep, to scatter because they see this lion. She doesn't chase them. She, doesn't, she sits there and watches because as they go, she directs them to run down the pathway where daddy lion is sitting. And then daddy lion's hiding behind the thicket. And when he sees the weak one come by, he doesn't go for the big strong one that ran out first. He's waiting. He's waiting. He finds the one that he thinks is weak, the one that's furthest away. And he pounces. Boom! And he gets him. He grabs him by the neck and drags him out and just drags him all up back to the thing. He's got him. It's done. It's over with. The unsuspecting, panicked, ridden person is now dead. That's a picture of what the wicked are doing. They are setting up ambushes. They are lying secretly, just like a lion. They're just waiting. They are modeling who their, who their father is. And their father, and who, who it is, is Satan himself. The Bible tells us that Satan does that towards Christians, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That Satan walketh around like what? A roaring lion seeking what? Whom he may devour. Mm -hmm. Satan is a good ambusher for Christians. He's waiting for you to... Play around with sin a little bit. Get away from what's right. No, boy, he'll jump on you. You think everything's going good. Little do you know you're getting attacked, right, by Satan. He set up his little, his little lures over there like the mama lioness and driving you over there. And then when he gets a chance, he's going to pounce on you. Well, that's what these crooks do. That's what these criminals do. That's what the wicked do. They take advantage of the poor. And what they do, they set up ambushes just like a lion in the wait. And it helps explain it. He, he lieth and waits secretly as a lion in his den or in the thicket. He lieth and wait to catch the poor. That's what he's waiting to do. He cannot wait. The word uh, uh, catch there means to seize, to grab onto, to hold, to take advantage of. He's waiting to seize the poor. And guess what happens? He doth catch the poor, right? He, he doesn't fail at what he's doing. He gets them. He'll scam the right people. He'll murder the right people. He'll take advantage of the right people. He'll figure it out. The ones that he was planning to scam, he, he, he knows who they are. He knows who the hurt ones are. He knows who can't defend themselves. He will catch them. And that draws another example from human side. When he draweth him into his net. So now the picture turns from nature, a picture of a lion ready to pounce, to now a hunter who is setting out his trap for the animals, setting out his trap for the birds, has his net all set up, waiting there, has it all set up, has his, his net, the food, whatever it is. The animal comes, eats that food, boop, the net captures him, sucks him up. And now he's got him. He's trapped. And now it's his food. Those are the two pictures that the Bible gives us of what the wicked are like. They set all that stuff up for us. For everyone. They, they look around to see what they can do. And then it goes on and explains a little more in verse number 10. He croucheth and humbleth himself. Now, don't think that that humble self means that he humbles himself before God. The word humble just means to get low to the ground. Mm -hmm. So when he's out on the hunt... You're not going to see a criminal all proud and boastful out there on the hunt. Well, but they'll get jumped or usually they'll, they'll, that won't happen too much. What happens is, though, they'll slurk behind the crowd. They'll sneak away to a little corner. They'll crouch themselves down and not just like crouch. They'll, I'm not going to do it because the stomach won't let me. But they get real low to that <laughs> ground and they're ready to pounce just like that lion. If you ever watch the lion or a cat attack, he doesn't stand on all fours while he's attacking. He's got on those haunches and he's down real low to that ground so he can spring quickly. And that's what it's saying. That's what it means. He humbleth means not that he's humbling himself, but that he is low to the ground. The word actually comes from the idea of crushing, getting so close to the ground, almost uh, 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 like being crushed. He croucheth and humbleth himself. Why? That the poor may fall by his strong ones. The idea about the poor falling to the strong ones is the idea the poor, again, is the unfortunate ones. May fall means to collapse or to fall in. 
by his strong ones is literally from the idea of a mighty water or waves or, or a giant sea. It's, it means the mightiness, the vastness of it all. So it's like someone drowning in water. They get so overwhelmed when they're caught. They can't do anything else but just fall into them. They get caught in their trap. The wicked have planned it out. The wicked have so set it up. The wicked are so rotten that once it finally springs on you, you don't know what happened to you. And you feel overwhelmed with what's going on. That's what it means to fall into his strong ones. It means to fall into his mightiness. To fall into his vastness. To fall into his surrounding water with no way to look around. You're just going to drown in what he's done to you. And that's what David sees going on, whether it's to him or to the people that he's the king to, or whether it's just watching the wicked go around. He's looking at his world and saying, look at these people being taken advantage of. Look at this going on. That guy didn't even see it coming. And he gets overwhelmed and drowned in it all. God, when are you going to intervene? Well, this next verse is interesting. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't know what it stands for, but I'll explain it the best I can. He has said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He will never see it. So I could read this two ways. Who is the he referring to? If the he is referring to the wicked one, I'll read it that way. He has said in his heart, God hath forgotten. He hideth his face. He'll never see it. That's how the wicked would say it. Right. But could it be the one that's being overwhelmed? Could it be that poor person that is being overwhelmed in the water? And he, meaning the poor person, says in his heart, God hath forgotten. God's forgotten all about me. He hideth his face. That's how David started the psalm. Why are you hiding God? He hideth his face. He will never see it. If God hasn't intervened, obviously he doesn't see what's going on. So which way do you take it? I don't know. That's what I said. But the he there is not, you can't tell who the he is referring to. Now what's my personal opinion? My personal opinion is it's referring to the one overwhelmed. Because it looks like it's going to be a transition from this is who the wicked are, this is where the, the poor cry is, and then if you look at the next verse, verse number 12, David cries out, Arise, O Lord! Right? Like, come on, Lord, start defending them. So to me, that's what it looks like. And the reason why I draw that conclusion personally is because we've already learned that the wicked person doesn't even think of God. He could care less about God. He doesn't believe God even exists. So why would he say, ah, God forgets? He don't even care about God. To begin with. But if you want to take it that this is the wicked one's heart and action to say, I can do what I want because God's going to forget everything I do and God doesn't see me and there is no, then fine, you can take it that way. Like I said, either one make good sense to me and I don't know where to draw the line on that. So I could just tell you where I take it to. I take verse 11 to mean it's the person that is overwhelmed by the strong ones. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. God's, I, I've been there. I've been there where I've seen some tragic things happen. And I, I won't say God for God, but I will say, God, why? God, why did you let this happen? God, couldn't you have done this or that? Or, you know, especially if you see a loved one go through something really difficult. You see something that you have no, you know, you, you have nothing. It's all out of your hands. And you see a tragic event. Don't you feel like just saying, God, why? Why did you let this happen? Didn't you see it? Did you forget that you're supposed to protect us and look over us and guide us and help us and we're being overrun by evil? Remember, this is also a picture of the tribulation period. Remember, we covered that, that this is like that prophetic psalm where Psalm 9 dealt with the millennial kingdom, how Jesus was going to judge all the nations and all that other kind of stuff. This could also be a foreshadowing of what it's going to be like when the wicked one, because it's used singularly here, the wicked one, Satan himself, the Antichrist, is just killing the Jews off left and right in the end times, right? And I'm sure the Jews' heart is going to be, God, you forgot about us. We never thought you were, we were your people. And until Jesus returns, until they see him, then they shall repent and put their faith in him when he comes back that second time. So this is kind of like a foreshadowing here. Chapter 10 can be dealing like with the, when the wicked one, when Satan himself uh, inhabits that man, the beast, right? The Antichrist. And this would be the Antichrist attitude towards people. You can't believe what he says. Remember, he's going to go back on his covenant that he made with Israel. He's going to go back with all the kings. He's going to lie to all of them. He's all about fraud. He, he gets the, uh, the, uh, uh, the beast to uh, 
issue out the number. And if you don't have that number, remember he threatens you. If you don't have that number on your hand, you're not going to be able to work. You're not going to be able to eat. You're not, right? So we can see how this can picture foreshadowing what it's going to be like in the tri great tribulation period. So that's where we're at. Well, don't want to leave you on that bad note. So let's read verse number 12. He says, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up thine hand. Forget not the humble or your poor people. And we'll cover that next week as we go on continuing further on. So tonight, I know not a lot of fun, but I tell you what, when you look at our world, you can start understanding it a little bit more. Yes? Did you hear that the Pope said that um, homosexuality is a human um, was it, experience and it's, it's not a crime, but oh. it is a sin? Oh, I, I don't usually get too much what the Pope says. So. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, they, they even let me know, but I, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't pay attention to him too much. But yeah, it's going all over the place. Yeah. Every religion's doing it. Every, every church, don't think the Baptist church isn't doing it either. There's a number of Baptist churches that are out there fighting with that and are dating wrong types of people, not going according to the Bible. But that's what they did during the times of kings. Remember, they wanted to make up their own people. They didn't go by the, the, the rules that God set forth, who could be pastors or who could be priests. They set up their own priests. They set up their own holidays. Yep. So, you know, When a country falls from God, you can see. Yeah. Just study the nation of Israel. You'll see how our country is also doing the same thing. Hopefully we'll get back to the Lord um, and get right. But look at that stuff. I know it's going to frustrate you. I know it's going to be hard, but hopefully this will help you keep your antennas up. Not everything you hear is true right? <laughs> that you go out there and look at it and, and get it for face value. Realize there are people that are trying to threaten your children. There are people trying to threaten your husband, threaten your wife. There are people that speak very smoothly, but under their tongue, they really want to hurt you. And they're just trying to get you to do stuff you ought not to do. How much more do we need to cling to the word of God Amen. and to each other? Hopefully this doesn't happen to us. Hopefully we are all genuine believers and we're all here that want to encourage one another. That's why the Bible says, don't forsake the assembly of ourselves together. We're here to encourage, to help, to pray, to stand behind each other, to do those things. So that way one of us doesn't get shot like one of those gazelles scared out of their mind. And we all start panicking and then boom, that one's taken off. Boom, that one's taken off. We don't want that, right? We, we want to be strong for the Lord and do what he needs to do. He wins in the end, right? You're on the winning team if you know the Lord. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God, Lord. And this chapter here is a difficult one, Lord. That, that question is hard for us. We look at our world. We look at the United States. And Father, our, our government is just packed with examples. Our schools are packed with examples. Our communities are packed with examples. So Lord, I pray that we would be strong, that we wouldn't be deceived. That, Father, that we wouldn't be suckered into these things or taken advantage of. That we would have our antennas up and always have our heads on a swivel like in the Marine Corps or police officers. And, and looking for those opportunities where people may be setting up an ambush. Give us the wisdom we need, Father. Help that whole, We're very thankful that you've given us the Holy Spirit. May we be submissive to it when he puts up those red flags. When he gives us that hair to stand up on the back of our necks. When he, when he speaks to us through our hearts that, Lord, we would listen and not dismiss it. Help us, Lord, to uh, uh, trust in you and, and to encourage one another. Please bless your people here tonight as only you can. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.